Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a mixture of pleasure and honor and just being simply daunted to tell you something about whether the sun is to blame for global warming. This is the title that was given me by the organizers. Bless them. <laughs> and of course, it's doubly daunting after all the other talks you have heard yesterday and today. I mean, just incredible stuff. And I'm really glad I'm on now and not at the end of the week because I wouldn't be able to say a word by then. So let's start with global change. And the first question is, has the Earth warmed? And if it has, is this warming in any way significant? And is it important? So what you see plotted here is a graph of the temperature, global temperature, from the beginning when global temperatures have been put together, starting in the 1850s, till a couple of years ago. And each bar shows you the temperature globally averaged over a year for the whole world. And the black line is a smooth curve going through that. And you can see that there are ups and downs, but there are more ups than downs. So that since about 1900 or 1910, temperature has gone up by about 0.8 degrees. Now, 0.8 degrees does not sound like very much. Right? Coming from Germany to Tenerife, the temperature difference was a lot more than 0.8 degrees. But this is averaged, as I said, over day and night, over summer and winter, over northern and southern hemispheres, low and high latitudes. And then, 0.8 degrees is quite a lot. And you can get a feeling for that by looking at natural systems that react strongly to changes in temperature, for example, glaciers. So here are two pictures taken about the same spot of the Rhone Glacier in the Alps, Switzerland, country I come from. The first taken in 1900, the second in 1960. And you can see that in 1900, the glacier came right down into the valley, whereas in 1960, you could just see the tip of it up on the mountain. In the meantime, it's receded even more. It's not disappeared. The glacier goes on up on the, uh, in a higher valley, but it's grown very much smaller. Maybe an even more impressive example is the Muir and Riggs glaciers in Alaska where the lower photograph shows what you would see from a certain vantage point in the year 1941. That's the arrow, the lower arrow. And the upper one shows what you see in 2004. So in the lower one, you see a sea of ice, and the upper one, just see a sea. In both these cases, the temperature difference was 0 0.4 degrees globally. That does not mean that locally the temperature was 0.4 degrees different since different parts of the globe have changed quite differently. Now, is this recent temperature rise extraordinary? So you have to look back in time, and that becomes difficult because, you know, the thermometer hasn't been invented for such a long time. So you have to use other proxy indirect data, and people fight a lot. They get different results, and they fight a lot, which one is correct and which one isn't. But here you can see three different reconstructions based on different data sets. Uh, these are the brown lines and the blue lines going back about 1,800 years in the case of the longest one. And if you compare that with the modern level that we have, that's the red line up there. And you can see that temperatures at present seem to be higher than anything that was reconstructed for the last 1,800 years even with the very big scatter and error bars that they have. These are the blue shaded and the yellow shaded curves. So it does seem to be extraordinary. I think these curves, and there is more data, provide ample proof for global warming, but not everyone is convinced. People want to have more data. 
showing that it's really, really their real proof. And if you need that, you can have it. <laughs> All right? I think. Okay, looks like everyone is convinced. <laughs> so, let's move on to the next question. Is it man-made or not? And some people get more uptight about that. Now, the process for man-made global warming is due to the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect, that's what you have in a greenhouse, as the name states. You have sunlight coming in through your glass roof and glass walls. And glass lets sunlight through. The sunlight gets absorbed, at least a part of it does, by the ground, by the plants, whatever. And then a lot of it gets re-emitted as infrared radiation, but glass is opaque to a large extent to infrared radiation, so a lot of this does not get out. And infrared means heat. So finally, what you get is a much warmer uh, greenhouse uh, than you have in the surroundings. And people have used that for centuries to grow plants in climates where they wouldn't otherwise grow. Now besides glass, there are also other chemicals that produce a greenhouse effect. And carbon dioxide is one of these. Again, carbon dioxide is transparent to um, visible light, but opaque to a large fraction of infrared radiation. And if you look at the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, shown here for the last 1,100 years, you can see that for much of the time it remained constant. And you can even go further back in time, 10,000 years, and it's fluctuated a little bit, but it hasn't really changed very much. But in the last 200 years or so, a very steep rise has started, basically because of the burning of fossil fuels gas and oil, which when you burn them, you release carbon dioxide into the air. Now, if you compare this chart with the one I showed you before of the temperature rise, uh, you can see that the temperature rise occurred in these last 150 years, and that also happens to be the time when you have the steepest increase in greenhouse gases. Now, you can put this increase of greenhouse gases into global models modeling the Earth's atmosphere, circulation in the atmosphere, in the oceans, the effect of the ground, etc. These are so-called general circulation models. And they will predict, to reasonable accuracy, some less, some more, the pattern of warming that has been observed in the last 50 to 100 years. Pattern mean geographically, right? Because different parts of the world have uh, heated up in different ways. So you can think, okay, it could very well be that this warming is due to man-made greenhouse gases. You can then take these same models, compute scenarios of what the greenhouse gases, the concentrations, it's not just carbon dioxide, there is a bunch of others, um, what they're um, concentrations are going to be over the next 90 years, or 89 years to be precise, till the year 2100, and compute what the temperature would be. So on the left diagram, you have different scenarios of how, if we were to continue putting further greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, emitting more of them, these would be, for example, the red line going up, or if at some point we reach a decision, okay, we are going to emit less of those. Um, that would mean a drastic change in the way we produce and use energy. That could be, for example, the blue curve, which continues to increase for the next 20, 30 years, but then starts to decrease. On the right, you see the temperatures that you would get up to the year 2000, 
or it goes a bit beyond a couple of years, beyond 2000, you have the actual measurements. Beyond that, um, there is uh, computations, predictions into the future, and you can see that the red curve, which corresponds to the red curve on the left, goes up very high, so that we would have a temperature increase by something like three, three and a half degrees higher than we have at present. Blue curve goes up to something between one and a half and two degrees higher than what we have at present. So we can expect that if greenhouse emissions are the main cause for global warming, that we will have temperatures something like one and a half to uh, to two degrees. Oh, sorry, even by 2050, where all the curves are almost the same, haven't diverged very much, you would get one and a half to two degrees higher temperatures than you have now. There have been a number of calculations of consequences of global climate change. Now, these secondary consequences, they can be many of them quite dire, but uh, these computations are far less certain than those of the primary warming, which have their uncertainties as well. If you look at the spread from different models, it can be quite large. And one of the effects is rising sea level. Um, you expect rise of a meter or maybe even more, depending on which estimate you look at. There are also predictions that there will be more extreme weather events, more storms, stronger storms, etc. And some people claim that the series of strong storms, tornadoes, whatever that we have been having in the last years are already a signature of that, although that is maybe not yet so certain. Now, most of these consequences don't sound very positive, but of course there are some positive ones as well. For example, for German wines, it's going to be very good to have some extra global warming. They're going to get better, that's the prediction. There has also been a lot of talk about animals that have problems, that will have problems with global warming, and ice bears are in particular quoted. Uh, and for example, in this cartoon, the ice bear is saying the bad news is the ice cap is melting and it's going to be almost impossible to catch seals. But the good news is that if we keep moving south, there's tons of fat animals called humans who can't run very fast. <laughs> now, a question that is posed by many people is, if instead of humans, the sun could be to blame for global warming, So the first fact to remember is that the sun is the external source of energy for the earth. So it delivers 1.36 kilowatts for every square meter of ground facing the sun. This is, you know, at noon when the sun is high, if there are no clouds. That means it's fairly common on the south side of Tenerife, very uncommon in Germany where I live. If you convert that into what it means for the energy needs of humanity, in about 20 to 30 minutes, the sun provides to the earth enough energy to feed our needs for an entire year. Of course, it's not going to be possible and also something we might not want to do to try and use up all that, to, to harvest all that energy. But even if we don't, it's not going to waste because the energy from the sun is warming the earth, is warming the atmosphere. If the sun were to switch off, temperatures would plummet. There are some estimates that the atmosphere would cool down to below minus 200 degrees centigrade within a matter of weeks. That's a temperature at which nitrogen is no longer a gas. So that means a large part of our atmosphere would become a liquid. It will probably not remain so because the oceans will not cool quite as quickly as that. So you will have you know, nitrogen raining down, getting evaporated on the oceans and so on. But eventually you won't have an atmosphere anymore. 
Now, originally, I had on this slide saying, without sunlight, no life. But then I heard Jack Sostak's talk and thought, no, 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 no. That's not a good thing to say, right? So I changed it to, without sunlight, no higher life forms. That's much safer. But I think that we can safely say, right? That more complex life forms, like we or many others, would have great difficulty surviving. Now, what happens with the light from the sun when it reaches the Earth is pretty complex. And this cartoon here is a simplified rendition of all the processes that go on. And I'm not going to go into that in any detail here. Because there is another question that you have to pose if the sun is going to be to blame for global change, it would have to change. Right? Having a constant sun at whatever level is certainly not going to contribute to any warming or cooling. So let's turn to the sun and find out a little bit more about that. Now the sun is a very, very normal star. A star in the prime of its life. It's normal, it's average if you want, it's mediocre. You know, there are bigger stars, there are smaller ones, more massive, lighter ones, older, younger, whatever. By any parameter, it lies spank in the middle. It produces its energy in the core by a process called fusion there nuclei of hydrogen, these are protons, get together, stick together, fuse, and finally four of them form a nucleus of helium. This is the same process as takes place in hydrogen bombs on Earth, only on the Sun it runs in a controlled fashion, as one is also trying to produce on Earth in fusion reactors, but has not been successful so far. Well, in the sun it works, so it's the only working fusion reactor uh, in our vicinity. Now, the amount of energy released, and the energy is released basically because you're converting a part of the mass of these four hydrogen atoms into energy through Einstein's famous equation of E equals mc square. Per nucleon is not very huge, it's quite small actually. And the huge amount of energy that the sun produces and radiates away so lavishly into space just comes from sheer numbers, from sheer mass. So in every second, the sun will burn or turn a million tons of hydrogen into helium. And it's been doing that for the last four and a half billion years, which just gives an estimate of how massive the sun and its core are. Now the energy that is produced in the core moves in the form of light, or rather gamma rays in the beginning, then x-rays, etc. Outwards, it flows out, but because the matter is so dense, it takes it some time, estimates say something like 100,000 years, till the light actually reaches the surface. By that time, the temperature has gone down from something like 15 million degrees in the core to something like 6,000 degrees at the surface of the sun, and that's the light that we see. And once the, the light reaches the surface, it's radiated away into, into space, and eight minutes later it reaches the Earth. Now, most astronomers, if you ask them, if they think the sun is an interesting star or a boring one, they're going to say it's a boring star. And if you look at this image, yeah, it doesn't look terribly exciting, does it? Right? It's just a very empty disk with this one little spot on it, which could very well be something on the, on the lens of the projector, <laughs> but actually is a sunspot. And now let's go and look at this guy a bit closer. Let's zoom in. And while we're doing that, we will go from an instrument, the MDI instrument on SOHO, which has a low resolution, to a newer instrument, the SOT on the Japanese Hinode spacecraft. 
And as you go in, you suddenly see a lot of structure. Also, you see the earth to scale. See, the sunspot has a lot of fine structure, but you also have a lot of fine structure around the sunspot. These are so-called granules, these little cells with the bright centers and the dark surroundings. These are what, they're about the size of Spain and live about five minutes each. Um, and they are what brings up the energy from the interior just below the solar surface where it can finally be radiated away. So that's convective energy transport. You also see a lot more structure and dynamics if you look at the sun in certain filters, let's call them, with which you can see gas at different temperatures, it turns out that although the solar surface has a temperature of 6,000 degrees, the sun's atmosphere has temperatures ranging anywhere between a couple of thousand degrees and 10 million degrees, or even more. So what you see in the lower movie is gas at something like 10,000 degrees, that's a few thousand kilometers above the surface. Just for scale, the diameter of the sun is one and a half million kilometers, so 2,000 kilometers is not very much. And the upper image, you see um, radiation showing us gas at about a million degrees, so-called uh, active region loops. In both of these, time doesn't run quite as fast as in the movie. They have been speeded up. But you can see that things are extremely dynamic. There's, things are changing all over the place. What I showed you before were sort of the humdrum, everyday things happening on the sun. Whenever you look at it, you will see something like that, more or less. However, from time to time, it shows you know, really more spectacular fireworks. For example, when a flare goes off, as uh, in the movie that is, that is running now, again, we see gas at a couple of million degrees. And basically what has happened is that a considerable amount of energy, almost as much as the sun radiates uh, in, in total, is released in a very small part. Um, heats up the gas to multiple 10 million degrees, which then cools down, and as it cools down, you can begin to see it over here. And you see these beautiful loop structures forming. This is so-called flare. Then there are also coronal mass ejections. This is when you get real eruptions of solar material being thrown out into interplanetary space, and here is one that was captured by the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And you can basically only see the material that is falling down again because the image does not go far enough, but this coronal mass ejection, I'll show you later. These are uh, big bubbles of hot gas that are blasted out into interplanetary space. Now, all these phenomena that I have showed you so far, and many, many more, could talk for hours about that, are basically down, come down to one quantity that drives them, and that's the magnetic field. And that may sound a bit surprising because the magnetic field of the body, you know, celestial body that we know best, is that of the Earth. And that looks something like this here, well behaved, something like a dipole. This is, I hasten to add, in case there are any geophysicists here is a very, very simple sketch. This is a cartoon, right? The real magnetic field of the Earth is more complicated than this. And actually, even physicists will notice, if they look carefully, that there is a physical error in this cartoon. So it's a cartoon. It's very simplified. Now, this is an equally simplified cartoon of the magnetic field of the Sun at a given moment in time, right? And although it's extremely simplified, you can immediately see that it's a lot more complex than the magnetic field of the Earth. And in addition, it is changing all the time. It's very, very dynamic. Right? You make this picture again a few days later, and it will look quite different. One thing you notice here is that you have these loop-like structures, which you also see in uh, the images on the right, and that you also see in the left. So what you see on the right is X-ray images of the sun's atmosphere showing gas at a few million degrees. And you see the same loop-like structures as you see in the magnetic field lines in the image on the left. And that suggests to us that the heating of the gas somehow is related to the magnetic field. 
Now, how does the sun influence the Earth? Right. That is the topic of the talk. Now, it depends a little bit on time scale. And if you look at very short time scales, then it's relatively clear what happens. On the left, you see a, um, a movie showing the surroundings of the sun. So the sun itself is that little golden ball right in the center. And what you, other things you see are these dots. So the dots moving from, the white dots moving from left to right are stars in the background, stars of the Milky Way. Because this whole movie runs about two weeks and the Earth, as you can see in the image on the upper right, this is by the way a photograph taken by uh, Claude Nicolier, speaker, the last speaker of, of yesterday evening. So he's not just a great astronaut, but also a great photographer, as you can see. But the consequences need not always be positive. And the lower right is showing you what happened in June 2003 at a time when solar activity was high and uh, one of these coronal mass ejections came and hit Earth fair and square. It overloaded the power grid in northeastern Canada and led to widespread blackouts that spread right into northeastern United States. Also, because this conference is very closely related to spaceflight, I wanted to say a few words about hazards for human spaceflight. Many of these flares, the large ones, they produce large proton events. So you have many energetic protons coming in and hitting the Earth. Now, luckily, the Earth is protected by its magnetic field forming the magnetosphere, so that most of the particles are glanced off and fly off into further out into interplanetary space. Some of them will come down near the poles so that on the whole, astronauts in low Earth orbit are relatively well shielded. Not completely, some particles will reach them, but relatively well. However, if you leave the magnetosphere, for example, if you go to the moon or to Mars, as astronauts would like to do, then you have to think of something else. And actually, if you go back and look at when the Apollo missions were flying and when there were large proton events from the sun, I think we were very lucky. Yep. They basically missed them. And if a really large event had hit the mission, when it was outside the magnetosphere, and to go to the moon, you are outside the magnetosphere most of the time, that could have had very dire consequences for the astronauts. So it's just something to bear in mind. It's actually one of the major hurdles when going to Mars. For the moon, you can take a calculated risk because you're outside the magnetosphere only for a few days. When you go to Mars, you're outside it for multiple years, basically, in interplanetary space and the chances that you're hit by one of these things is pretty high. If you go to very long scales, actually, let me just jump over this because time is running. Let's come to the time scale um, that we're interested in, decades to centuries, global warming. Does the sun change at these time scales? And indeed, yes, we can see that there is one time scale on which it changes very strongly, and that's the solar cycle. That's something like 11 years on average. And what you see in this image is x-rays from the sun, one image of the sun taken every year, starting at the time when the sun was very uh, magnetically active, and it was at maximum in the lower left, and going up to a time when it was magnetically inactive at the top there, and then a few years later, you get the x-rays back again. The change is a factor of about 100. Okay, so the amount of x-rays changes very, very strongly. Many other things change also as you go from activity minimum to maximum. For example, the number of sunspots. And the number of sunspots is used very often because they're very easy to measure. And it's the longest running record we have 
actually one of the longest running records in, in science as a whole of direct measurements, starting in the year 1610, exactly one year after the telescope was invented, <clears throat> and continuing uninterrupted until now. And you can see the, the solar cycle very nicely uh, in, in this graph. You can also see that the cycles are different. Some are weak, some are strong. And also that there was a time from about 1640 to 1700, 1710, when there were basically no sunspots, the so-called Maunder minimum. And if by chance or not, this happened to coincide also with the coldest part of the Little Ice Age in Europe, certainly. There is also another period, about 1800 to 1820, when solar activity was weak, and again, either by chance or not. These were the coldest decades in England, certainly, um, since the end of the Little Ice Age, and also that is the time when there was the last Christmas fair on the Thames. That means the Thames was frozen over sufficiently strongly that you, know, you could actually hold a fair on it. There may be other reasons why the Thames has not frozen over in the, in the meantime. I'm just saying, you know, there could be something, but it does not in any way mean there is. And one problem is that this data set, although it's long, 400 years, is not really long enough to see if there are more coincidences of this type. Now, fortunately, nature has given us other ways of finding out what solar activity was like in the past. And one of these is to use cosmic rays coming in from outside the solar system. These are high energy particles, mainly protons, coming in at nearly the speed of light into the solar system. Some of them will reach the Earth. When they reach the atmosphere, they will sooner or later collide with an atom in the atmosphere. They have enough energy that they will change this atom, for example, from a nitrogen atom, there will be a nuclear reaction, and they could turn it into carbon atom. But not normal carbon, but for example, carbon-14, which is a radioactive isotope. It's used by archaeologists to date things because it decays away in about 6,000 years. Because it's radioactive, if you find any carbon-14, you know it wasn't there in the beginning when the Earth was formed. It was produced by a reaction like this. The radiocarbon, just like normal carbon, gets then breathed in by trees and will end up in a tree trunk, and you can find out how much radiocarbon was produced at a certain time by dating the trees, which can be done very accurately. Now, what does this have to do with the sun? Now, the sun's magnetic field just like the Earth's magnetic field shields us from the energetic particles from the sun, the sun's magnetic field shields us from the energetic particles coming in from the galaxy. So if the sun's magnetic field is strong, less radiocarbon will be produced than if it is weak. So using that, we can determine when were times when the sun was active and when the sun was not active. And you see that in this diagram over here. This goes now over 7,000 years. Today would be up on the right, and you're going further back in time as you're going to the left. And you can see that there were always times, there were a number of them, like the Maunder minimum, when the sun was extremely inactive. But there were also a number of times, marked here in red, when the sun was pretty active. And actually, if you look at the extreme right, you will see that we have been in a time when the sun was extremely active over the last 70 years or so. So so-called grand maximum of activity. So it's an unusual time for solar activity that we have been in. We can then go and compare this with reconstructions of climate, of temperature, over the last X thousand years. And this has been done by a number of people. And one of the curves you see over here is solar activity, and the other one is um, a proxy for temperatures. The yellow one is for the Earth's climate, the blue one is for solar activity, and you see that there, has, there is some reasonable correspondence 
in particular times when it was cool on the Earth, and it's inverted over here, so the cool periods are when the yellow curve is high, tend to fall together with times when the sun was very inactive. Okay, does this mean that the sun has been driving climate? To a certain extent, maybe, in the past 10,000 years or so. How could it do that? And there are a number of paths by which sun could drive climate, and because time is running, I will just tell you a little bit about one of these. And that is if the total brightness of the sun changes. As the total brightness of the sun changes, the total amount of energy coming to the Earth will change. And you can go and measure that. And indeed, you find that the sun is not completely steady. It does show a small variation. Um, <clears throat> this is a measurement, or this is a set of all measurements that have been carried out of the total brightness of the sun. It goes back 30 years. You have to do it from space to be sufficiently precise. And you can see two things. The first is, just look at the, at the black line. And you see that there is a cyclic change with a period of around 10, 11 years. Hmm, sounds like the activity cycle of the sun. The second thing is that the amplitude is very small, 0.1%. Right. So the sun is a pretty steady star, but not a completely steady star. What is producing this brightness changes, you can see it has got to do with the magnetic field. And you can see, for example, the dips in brightness are produced when there are sunspots, dark sunspots passing over the disk. Sunspots are magnetic. There are other magnetic features that lead to brightening. In the meantime, we can model these changes with high accuracy. We think we sort of understand what's going on. And we can then take these models and compute what the sun's brightness was in the past. That is a little bit more tricky, but in general, what different people find is that on these longer time scales, the variation, the long-term variation of the sun's brightness was larger than what we see here over a solar cycle time scale. And then we can go and look if we find any comparison or any um, things that fit together between solar activity, solar irradiance, and climate, or even weather, on Earth. And I'll just show you two examples. On the top left, you see two curves. The upper one is solar activity, which is running sort of parallel to uh, solar irradiance. You can see that there are fluctuations due to the 11-year cycle, but at the same time, there is also a longer-term trend, which is sort of the long-term variation. At the bottom is Central England temperatures. I've taken Central England temperatures because that's the longest single uninterrupted series of temperature measurements anywhere in the world. It goes back to the early 1600s. The temperature that is plotted here, we have taken out global warming. Right? So this is not climate change, this is really weather. And these are winter temperatures, so you can check if a particular winter was cold or not. And what you find is that the coldest winters always occur when the sun was very inactive. It doesn't work the other way around. If the sun was active, you could still have a cold winter, no, oh, sorry, if the sun was active, it did not mean you would have a very, a very warm thing. But if you have a cold winter, it was only then when solar activity was low, if you subtract out global warming. So this is something which works also for Central Europe, but may or may not work for the rest of the world. This could do with local um, effects, on the, on the weather and climate patterns. If you look globally, if you compare global temperatures, and these are the, the blue curves here, the two slightly different reconstructions of temperature there, and you compare that with the irradiance of the sun, these are the red curves, you notice 
that the agreement is not terribly good. There may have been some contribution of the sun to the early rise in temperature. It certainly cannot have been the dominating effect for that because solar irradiance is running behind global temperature rise. And if you look after about 1970 or so, you see the two curves are really diverging from each other. On the one hand, solar irradiance is showing a slight trend going down, whereas temperatures have risen very strongly in this time. So half of the, the 0 0.4 degrees out of the 0.8 has happened in this time and solar activity has actually been decreasing somewhat and the sun has been darkening in a very small way. So this suggests, although again it's not yet proof, right, it suggests that very likely the sun has played a minor role in producing the global warming of the last decades. And that very likely we have to look at ourselves and what we are doing to the earth for the cause. We could also say that we have started a huge, gigantic experiment with the only home we have far and wide. And we cannot be sure of the outcome. Now, this was initially my last slide, but I thought this is not really very positive, right? I should, um, I have reduced the role of the sun so far that as a solar physicist, I can't leave you like that. So <clears throat> let me come to a very, very last slide and the sun's influence on a time scale of years. I had to look into unconventional literature to find something that's really striking. So this is not in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. <laughs> but it does say, scientists, shocking prediction, sun will burn out in two years and we'll be turned into human ice cubes. The newspaper is about two years old, so it could happen any day now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Solanke. Now we have time for a few questions. Are you in favor of geoengineering initiatives? Well, that's actually a political question, right? Uh, and as a scientist, no, I don't think I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in real great favor of geoengineering initiatives, at least not if we start something immediately, because I think we just haven't understood a sufficient amount of what is going on in the climate system at present. This may change. Maybe in 10, 15 years, it'll be different. Our understanding may be more. Okay, any other question? Okay, thank you, Mr. Shalangi. Yeah.